Well, good afternoon. It's a great honor to convene this afternoon's session and to introduce our speaker. Paul Waddell is Professor Emeritus of Theology and Religious Studies at St. Norbert College. A leading voice on the topic of friendship and the Christian moral life, he's the author of numerous books exploring these topics. Titles include Friendship and the Moral Life, The Primacy of Love, Becoming Friends, The Moral of the Story, Happiness in the Christian Moral Life, and most recently with our friend Charlie Pinches, Living Vocationally, The Journey of the Called Life. From 2010 to 2020, he was a member of the Advisory Council for the Network for Vocation and Undergraduate Education, otherwise known as NetView. Paul's service to the church and the academy has been one of great significance. First at Catholic Theological Union, then at the University of Scranton, and then for many years at St. Norbert. He's been recognized for outstanding teaching, scholarship, and service. He is truly respected and beloved as a scholar, as a teacher, and as a servant of the church. I've known Paul Waddell for two decades, first as a colleague and then as a close friend. He is someone for whom the quest for happiness in the moral life is not a theoretical exercise. He is, as I told someone earlier today, authentically good. His writings on friendship and the virtues are not only rhetorically graceful and inspiring, they are true to the man that is Paul Waddell. He will offer for us a lecture today titled Journeying Together to God, Accountability and Christian Friendship. Please join me in welcoming Paul Waddell. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, but thanks so much to Darren for that very gracious introduction. I always feel when anybody says such nice things about me, I should just sit down and call it a day. So, uh, but it's also wonderful to be back here. I consider Baylor uh, a second home in many ways. I've been down here, I think, at least 10 times um, since 2006. It's a place of, of many friends for me. And it not only, every time I come here, I was thinking about this this morning, it's not only good for my mind, it's good for my soul. Uh, so there's something special, I think, that's happening here uh, with the Institute for Faith and Learning, but at, at Baylor, that's, uh, it's just good to be here. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. When Darren invited me to speak at this conference, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, talk about accountability and friendship. Well, I was a bit taken back because over the years, I've thought a lot about friendship, but I never really thought that much about what I'm going to share with you today. Namely, what, why account accountability matters and what account accountability means in friendship, particularly a Christian understanding of friendship. After spending so much of my career focused on friendship, it's odd that it took me so long to consider accountability in friendship because without accountability, friendship is impossible. Without accountability, a relationship, whatever else it is, is inherently something other than friendship. So we can't really get far thinking rightly about friendship, especially the substantive and morally formative relationships that Aristotle called friendships of virtue or character without considering accountability because accountability is inscribed into the very being and meaning of friendship. To enter into a friendship is to be called to accountability. To enter into friendship is to be schooled in accountability. Now we know this really from our own experience. If a friend makes a request of us, ordinarily we not only want to honor that request, but also feel that we ought to honor that request precisely because that person is our friend. 
In fact, if we cannot, we typically feel that we owe our friend an explanation. This common experience illumines the quintessential moral character of genuine friendship. Friendship and accountability are integrally connected. In fact, they are absolutely inseparable because friendship is an inherently ethical relationship constituted by mutual obligations and responsibilities. Indeed, it is only in acknowledging and faithfully honoring those obligations and responsibilities that we can realize the deep goodness and joy that friendships bring to our lives. So I think that's key. <laughs> Without accountability, we'll never be blessed by friendship. Uh, friendship is a rich, <laughs> richly humanizing relationship, but without accountability, uh, we won't know the, uh, the goods of friendship. I should tell you, <laughs> Darren just told me, I sweat really easily. Uh, he said, Paul, you sweat if it's 20 degrees, so if you think, why is he sweating so much? It's just me. I've never fainted, so. <laughs> but I, if I do, I hear there's a really good medical school here, so I'm in good hands. <laughs> Uh, so today, today I want to explore what accountability means in friendship in two ways. First, I will consider why accountability is so intimately inter intertwined with friendship that it constitutes a moral claim that friends should never casually ignore. My hope is that this first section will provide a framework for thinking about accountability and friendship that will be helpful for the second section. There, I'll, I'll explore accountability in Christian friendship, what it means and what it asks of the friends when they, as friends, are journeying together to God. I'll do that primarily in conversation with Thomas Aquinas, but with some timely interjections from Augustine and a final word from Elbert of Rival. So first, why accountability is, con is constitutive of friendship. The first and, and most fundamental reason that friendship is always accompanied by accountability and why that accountability should never be taken lightly is because friendship is an essential element of a good life. Without friendship, we cannot flourish as human beings. We are created for friendship. We are wired for friendship. We are continually called to friendship because we need to live in healthy, challenging, transformative and enduring relationships if we are truly to live at all. As Genesis 2.18 testifies, we cannot go through life alone and unaccompanied. From the outset, we cannot make our way without other people supporting us, guiding us, and encouraging us just as we do them. The heart of being human is to live in friendship with others. The heart of being human, I think, is to live in friendship with others. Uh, it's not something we do when we have time on our hands. <laughs> it's not a lifestyle option. It's essential to being human. And that's because if we are to grow, if we are to develop, to change, and to flourish, and if we are to know any degree of happiness and fulfillment as human beings, we need people who know, love, and care for us. We need people who have affection and goodwill towards us, as we do for them. We need people who like us, enjoy us, and through their love for us, find meaning and joy in bringing us more fully to life. That's the grace of friendship. Through the love of others, through the goodness of others, you and I are brought, are brought more fully to life. For a friend, that's not a burdensome obligation, it's a joy. So in friendship, we contribute to another person's flourishing as they do to our own, which is something we need for a genuinely good human life. Now, this all goes back to something that Steve Evans said last evening. Human beings are social creatures. For us, to be is to be in relationship. That is why our need for friendship is as inescapable as it is deep. And why, without friendship, our lives are seriously impoverished? But that profound neediness and that radical dependence and vulnerability is precisely why accountability that is inscribed into friendship is so morally serious. If friendships were not essential to human well-beings, 
if we could have a good life without them, then maybe what we owe our friends and what they owe us could be meager. If, contrary to Genesis, we could have a good and wholesome life all by ourselves, then maybe betraying the promise on which every friendship is built might be morally negligible. If we did not need to be dependent and vulnerable in order to become the persons God created us to be, then maybe we could take our friendships lightly. But if we are creatures who cannot really come to life without the love, goodwill, and faithfulness of others, then to welcome another into friendship is, at least implicitly, to promise that they will find with us one of the very relationships that they need in order to know the security and stability, the comfort and assurance, and the love and acceptance that no human being can do without. It is to let them know that they can count on us, that they can count on us to be for and with them, and that we welcome them into our lives as a gift to care for and cherish. This is why we should never enter into friendships without being willing to honor the moral claims that come with them, and it is, it is certainly why we should never end them casually or carelessly. So what I'm suggesting, it all goes back to the idea that we can't, we can't leave home really without friendships. Uh, if we're created uh, not to go it alone in life, then from the very beginning of life, the human journey requires uh, those kinds of relationships where we're uh, relationships of mutual love, uh, benevolence, respect, and presence to one another. So accountability is at the heart of friendship because to enter friendship with another person is to pledge that we will be attentive to them and available to them in ways that we cannot be to, with everyone. It is to testify that among all the neighbors that comprise our lives, we will love and care for them with a faithfulness and a devotion that we cannot extend to everyone. Through our attitudes, words, and actions, we exhibit accountability by letting our friends know that caring for their good is our good. It's not a burden. It's not something we dread, but the life of friendship is letting another person know that you, for you to care for them, for their good, is your good. And we honor accountability when we assure them that the friendship will remain a prized priority in our lives, rather than become a relationship from which we would stealthily disengage ourselves once we discovered, as we surely would, that steadfastly seeking the good of the friend could not only be occasionally tiresome and tedious, but also much more demanding than we originally anticipated. Uh, there's a line in a poem that talks about friendship as being love without wings. Uh, and that's what I'm suggesting here. The, the love of friendship is not always easy, uh, but friends perse persevere together. Uh, friendship is love without wings. So all this is necessary if the friends are to exhibit the trust and confidence, the reliability and openness that are absolutely essential for healthy friendships. Put differently, without mutual accountability sustained over time, which is another way of thinking about friendship, mutual accountability sustained over time, without that there is no way friends can know the meaning and satisfaction, the comfort and reassurance, much less the leisure and laughter that are gifts of any good friendship. It is only through accountability that we can know the precious gifts and blessings that friendships provide. A second reason that friendship is always to call to accountability is that in friendship, the friends increasingly enter into one another's life. And through that mutual participation, a bond is formed among the friends. Um, the only way a friendship can begin is to make space for another person in your life. Uh, so friendship requires an act of hospitality. Uh, it begins with hospitality. As soon as that happens, one person lets another person into their life, a bond begins to be formed. That bond, sh bond should not be easily dissolved because so much is lost when it is, and people are hurt often deeply when it is. 
This is not surprising if we consider what happens in the life of any real friendship. Friendships create a shared history, a history formed as each person opens his or her heart to another, as they confide in one another, as they trust one another, and grow closer together through their collective experiences. The knowledge of one another that accrues to the friends as they gradually reveal their strengths as well as their shortcomings, their successes as well as their failures, the good they have done along with much that they might sorely regret, heightens their responsibility to one another because friends know one another in ways that no one else does. That knowledge creates the psychological, emotional, and spiritual intimacy through which the friends become one, or as the ancients stressed, through which each becomes another self to the other. It is precisely because of that intimacy that the responsibility each friend has to the other is great. The bond between friends thickens as they navigate the joys and sorrows of life together, as they celebrate important events of life, but also as they steady one another through moments of disappointment, through times of prolonged difficulty, or perhaps terrible loss. And the bond grows especially resilient when friends fall short or hurt one another and choose to protect the love that lives between them through forgiveness. Through the myriad chapters of that shared history, friends discover that the essence of accountability and friendship is coming to the reassurance that each, beyond a doubt, can count on the other. Uh, sometimes I don't think we realize how important that is to have people that we absolutely sure are sure, without a doubt, that we can count on. Uh, to me, that's the soul of accountability. Uh, if every day I have to get up second guessing, uh, can I count on my wife? Can I count on my friends? Can I count on my neighbors? Uh, it's going to be a chaotic life. Uh, so friendship provides stability in our lives. This matters because over time, friends, friends not only become part of one another's story, but also together create a new story as their lives are increasingly intertwined. In fact, each becomes an integral part to the other's identity, so much so that two distinct individuals become a we. As Gary Chartier writes in his forthcoming book, Understanding Friendship, The Theological and Philosophical Inquiry, while many relationships contribute to making us how we are, close friendships help to make us who we are. Friendships, Chartier says, are identity constitutive, or as he succinctly puts it, friends give us ourselves. This means that we understand ourselves and define our lives in light of our friendships. It means, Chartier explains, that the shared history between the friends leads to the increasing incorporation of the friend and the friendship into the self, so that each becomes indispensable to the other's identity. It means that we not only know ourselves in and through the friendships of our lives, but we also grow more fully into who we are meant to be in and through those friendships. But because what is true for us is also true for our friends, because like us, their well-being and identity is inseparable from the friendship, then each needs and depends on the other to continue to be the person he or she has become in the friendship. As Chartier summarizes, to make another person a close friend is to make her part of oneself. Who one is then depends on who she is. Realizing that her love has shaped and continues to shape who one is, one, accept, one accepts that one's identity is a friend's gift. Uh, I think that uh, what Chartier is saying is that not being accountable in friendship is to be profoundly ungrateful. You know, if our identity is really the gift of our friends, how the love of other people shapes us, informs us, that not to be accountable is, is the same, I think, as being profoundly ungrateful. Now, much more could be said about the meaning and importance of accountability and friendship, and why accountability 
uh, is inscribed into the very meaning and being of friendship. But it should be clear not only that without accountability, friendships will come to a very sudden end, but even more that without accountability, friendships cannot possibly begin. So with that in mind, I want to explore what accountability means in Christian friendship. That is, what does accountability require of, of friends when they, as friends, are journeying together to God? As I mentioned at the outset, I'll re rely principally on Thomas Aquinas to answer that question, but will supplement Aquinas with contributions from Augustine and a final word from Elred Arrival. At one point in his analysis of the theological virtue of charity in the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas notes that grace and glory are closely related. Because, as he writes, grace is nothing else than a certain beginning of glory in us. That may be the most succinct description of Aquinas' understanding of the Christian life. For him, the Christian life is an itinerary to beatitude, a thoroughly providential pilgrimage that begins in grace and culminates in the incomparable bliss of sharing intimacy in the life, goodness, and happiness of God. Like Aristotle, Aquinas believed that happiness comes from participating in our highest possible good. Happiness is an activity. Happiness is something that we do. But for Aquinas, beatitude is ultimately found not in a virtuous life in this world, but in continually being drawn more fully into the triune life of God. As Fergus Kerr notes, the happiness which is the ultimate goal of human life is nothing other than sharing the bliss which is God's own life. For Christians, the telos of human life is not wealth, is not pre prestige and power, fame and acclaim, but abiding communion with God and the saints a communion that has begun here on earth and perfected in heaven. So for Aquinas, we make our way from grace to glory through charity, which he famously defined as a life of friendship with God that opens up in love and friendship with others. For Thomas, this is what the Christian life of grace is all about. We who have come from God are to make our way to God through a life of ever-deepening friendship with God, but a friendship that always necessarily is expressed by heartfelt love and friendship with others. Yes, we are created for friendship, but we are expressly created for friendship with God and cannot flourish unless our life is continually oriented to God. Yes, for us to be is to be in relationship, but especially a relationship of charity friendship with God that, un that unfolds in charity-inspired friendships with others. So for Aquinas, charity is more than a particular virtue. For Thomas, charity is a distinctive, wholly engaging, and redemptively transformative way of life that illuminates who we are, what we are about, and where we are going. Now those are basic questions that it's good to have answers to. <laughs> you know, who we are, what are we about, where are we going? For Thomas, we are beloved children of God, sacred revelations of God's love, goodness, and beauty. What are we about? We are pilgrims on a journey to God, a journey begun and sustained by grace, a journey defined by following and imitating Christ, a journey continually guided by the Spirit, and a journey abundantly blessed by all those walking al alongside with us. Where are we going? We are making our way to the heavenly banquet where all the friends of God joyous, joyously love, praise, and glorify God while, while joyfully loving one another. For Aquinas, charity friendship with God is the heart of the matter. Charity friendship with God is the graced trajectory of our lives. Moreover, since charity not only anticipates, 
the perfect and un unending participation in the divine life that is heaven, but allows us, however imperfectly and incompletely, to, sh to share in it now, it can rightly be described as both the talos of the Christian life and the itinerary or way to that talos. So Aquinas' account of charity offers a helpful context for thinking about the meaning of accountability in Christian friendship, because it reminds us that Christians should think somewhat differently about friendship. Christians can learn from Aristotle, Cicero, and other philosophers and thinkers about the meaning and, and importance of accountability and friendship, but ultimately they can only take us so far because Christians tell another story. We are part of a different narrative. As Aquinas' explication of charity suggests, friendship gives us companionship, support, encouragement, and joy in this life, but its ultimate purpose is to help us make our way to God by growing together in the new life of grace. In a Christian account of friendship, friends help one another remain faithful to their baptisms and the virtues of the gospel. They help one another remain committed to a life of discipleship. It's all spelling out what it means to be accountable. In Christian friendship, I'm accountable to my friend if I help him or her be faithful to their baptisms, if I help them live out the virtues of the gospel. And as they enter more deeply into a life or friendship with God, the friends guide one another in narrating their lives in light of the overarching narrative of God's salvific love. Of course, this means that we cannot live in charity friendship with God without other friends of God. Living that life, making our way from grace to glory, has to be something that we do together. On the itinerary to beatitude, we help one another grow in the love, goodness, and holiness of God. So for me, really, this is the church. Uh, there's an ecclesiology behind, I think, Aquinas' notion of charity. Uh, the church really is a community of friends of God where we help one another make our way to God. So how might Aquinas' vision of the Christian life as an itinerary to beatitude, centered in a life of charity, friendship with God, how might that inform how we think about accountability in Christian friendship? First, our understanding of accountability should continually be informed by, by the awareness that a life of charity begins and can only begin with God befriending us. Charity rests on a gift and never stops being a gift. This is why accountability and Christian friendship should be anchored in a profound sense of indebtedness and gratitude. A profound sense of indebtedness and gratitude that flow from the enduring recognition that God offers us healing, joy, and wholeness of life that we can never offer ourselves. Put differently, one reason that reason Christians should faithful, faithfully respond to what accountability requires in friendship is because they are forever saying thanks. Uh, to me, it's much easier to be accountable when we're grateful. Uh, so I think a good place to start thinking about accountability and friendship is to, to go back to the idea it all begins with a gift. The more we realize that, then being accountable is just another language for saying thanks. So here's why. Aquinas knew that friendship requires a certain degree of likeness and equality, which human beings obviously do not naturally have with God. But he insisted that the staggering disparity between God and ourselves is overcome when God befriends us. Aquinas' God is not an aloof or distant deity. On the contrary, God who infinitely transcends us eagerly reaches out to us, relentlessly seeks us, and endlessly desires to be in relationship with us. God wants us. And so Aquinas says, charity begins not with us reaching for God, but with God communicating to us God's very beatitude, a communication that in drawing us beyond the otherwise unsurpassable limitations of our nature, makes us enough like God 
to participate in the Trinitarian life of God. Friendship with God commences when God shares with us the love, goodness, and happiness that is God. Friendship with God begins when God draws near to us in love and welcomes us into the divine life. And remember I said earlier that friendship begins when we make space for another person in our life. Aquinas is really saying the same thing about God. <laughs> friendship with God begins when God draws near to us in love and God welcomes us into the divine life. To live in friendship with God is to live from that reality, to live from that center. So if friendships are defined by the good shared among the friends, the good that distinguishes friendship with God from any other friendship is that God joyfully bestows on us and ceaselessly invites us to receive the very life, love, and goodness that constitute divine beatitude. Jean-Pierre Torrell writes, God not only wants us to be happy, he wants us to be happy with the happiness with which he himself is happy, his beatitude. Living each day with the awareness that charity not only makes the otherwise hopelessly impossible possible, but also makes it the most promising possibility of our lives, should guide how Christians understand what is at stake when they reflect on accountability and friendship. Now, there's a second way that we can speak of the gifted character of a life for friendship with God that comes from Augustine. In his book, Friendship, the Key to Being Human, Victor Lee Austin notes that for Augustine, true friendship is not a relationship based on sympathy or some other common ground. Rather, true friendship is a divine gift. It is one way, Austin writes, that we experience God's grace. So Austin captures one of the more intriguing aspects of, the, of Augustine's theology of friendship. Augustine believes believe that the God who befriends us in grace, Christ, and the Spirit also befriends us through our friends. Friends are God's gifts to us. Friends are God's ingeniously providential blessings through which God cares for us, watches over us, guides us, sustains us, challenges and heals us, and brings us more fully to life. We do not so much seek these relationships as we receive them and are entrusted with them. Friends are the specially chosen people that God brings into our lives so that we might experience God's love through them and grow in God's love with them. For Augustine, God loves us in and through our friends. They are God's gifts given to us for providential purposes. Now, Augustine came to this understanding of friendship because he was wholly convinced that what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 7 was undeniably true. What do you have that you did not receive? Like Paul, after his conversion, Augustine came to see everything as a gift, including our friends. Friends are gifts of God's merciful and compassionate love. Friends are expressions of God's abiding care and goodness. And friends are memorable examples of how God can sometimes take us by surprise. Uh, have you ever had a friend where the first time you met them, you thought, we'll never be friends? Uh, and something happens, you know. That's an example of how God can sometimes take us by surprise. And uh, that's great. Our life is better because of that. But more than anything, in the life of real friendships, we discover that what the New Testament says is true. God is indeed love. Friendship teaches us that's not empty, vacuous rhetoric. What we learn through the embodied friendships of our life is that what the New Testament stakes the central claim of God on is absolutely true. God is indeed love. One reason we know this is that we've experienced how God loves us We've experienced how God reaches us, speaks to us, and teaches us, how God supports and encourages us, prods and blesses us, not apart from our friends, but through them. Uh, sometimes our friends can be pushy. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> sometimes we need to be pushed and prodded a little bit. Uh, so the, the grace of God works in fantastic ways. 
All this suggests that God ministers to us through our friends. For Christians, behind the gift of the friend is the gift giver. So a friendship is a kind of sacrament. Behind the gift of the friend is the gift giver. Augustine's theology of friendship can deepen our understanding of accountability in Christian friendship and perhaps make us less likely to shirk what that accountability asks of us. That is always a possibility because the longer we remain friends with someone, the more we come to know about them and the more they come to know about us. What we discover about them and they discover about us is not always easy to accept. A Christian account of friendship is ruggedly honest about the challenges and struggles that are part of any real friendship, including friendships centered in life with God. Friends learn of one another's gifts, but they also eventually learn of one another's shortcomings, weaknesses, irritating habits, crazy idiosyncrasies, and sinfulness. Friends help one another and encourage one another, but they also test one another's patience and capacity to love. And friends, especially close friends, can painfully disappoint one another, fail one another, and sometimes deeply hurt one another. When this occurs, what do we do with the gift? Do we continue to cherish the gift and to give thanks for it, or do we send it back to the gift giver? Do we work to heal and restore the gift through forgiveness and reconciliation, or do we let it die? Seeing our friends as gifts brought into our lives by God heightens the accountability we have to our friends and counsels us never to take it lightly. If friends are God's gift to us, we should be extremely wary to walk away from the gift. A second way that Aquinas illumines our appreciation for the meaning of accountability in Christian friendship is his understanding of the principal ways that friends are called to be accountable to one another. In general, accountability in friendship is principally expressed through active benevolence. Friends have goodwill toward us. Friends want our good. And they not only want our good, but they do what they can to bring it about. This means the most common way we are accountable to our friends is by consistently and insightfully working for their good. But what does this mean in Christian friendship? Aquinas answers that in his treatise on charity when he asks, does, does the love of charity stop at God or go on to our neighbor also? Not surprisingly, he replies that we must always love God more than we love anything or anyone else because God is the summum bonum, the highest and most excellent good, and because God is everyone's good. But our love for God would be grievously incomplete if it stopped with God rather than be extended to our neighbors. To live in charity friendship with God is to make loving God the abiding focus of our lives, the central theme of our story. But it is also always to love our neighbor, not in any way, but Aquinas says, for God's sake. So for Thomas, we're accountable in friendship when we love our friends, not in any way, but as he puts it, for God's sake. To love them for God's sake is to love them in their truest and most promising identity, as one who, like ourselves, has been befriended by God and is called to share fully in the life, goodness, and love of God. To love them for God's sake is to wish for them what we should always wish for ourselves, that their life be an itinerary to beatitude, a graced pilgrimage that culminates in everlasting communion with God and the saints. Or, as Aquinas also says, we rightly love our neighbors when we desire that they, like ourselves, be in God. So the principal way accountability is expressed in friendship amongst Christians is through the active, insightful, and persistent benevolence through which we seek what is truly good for our friends by helping them abide in a life of charity, by helping them continue on their journey to God by growing in charity friendship with God. 
Again, Augustine can, ex Augustine can expand our understanding of what this means. Like Aquinas, Augustine believed that Christian friendship was a way of life constituted by loving God and helping one another make their way to God. For Augustine, that's happiness. That's a life truly worth living, to be of one heart and one mind on our journey together to God. What distinguishes Christian friendship is that it comes into being among people who share a common love for God, a common desire to grow in the love of God, and a steadfast, steadfast commitment to accompany one another on their journey to God. Which means then accountability and friendship means I don't let my friend lose their way. You know, if friendship is helping each other on this journey together to God, if my friend loses his or her way, I don't just say, farewell, <laughs> I'll see you later. Uh, we help one another along. So in this context, friends mutually seek one another's good by teaching one another about the love of God, by forming one another in the love of God, by helping each other practice the love of God in the ordinary details of their lives. This is why Augustine spoke beautifully of friendship as schools of love, practices of perfection, and sanctifying ways of life. As disciples make their way, actively seeking one another's good by imitating Christ, they grow in virtues such as understanding, generosity, empathy, kindness, patience and compassion, honesty and loyalty, humility and forgiveness. And they especially grow in knowing what it means to love well. One reason we should not easily dissolve friendships is that they are the relationships in, what, in which we learn what it truly means to love God and our neighbors. Augustine spoke of friendships as schools of love because he knew that we learn to love not in imaginary relationships where loving is always easy and fulfilling, but we learn to love in the very real relationships of our lives, relationships that are often uplifting and immensely gratifying, but can sometimes ask more of us than we think we can give. One very common way that Christ friendship schools Christians in the discipline of love is calling them to abide in love when the people they have been given to love are creatively difficult to love. Uh, we all talk about we're so creative, <laughs> not always in the best way. My wife has never used those exact words, but her facial expression often conveys, Paul, today you're being especially you know, creatively difficult uh, to love. Uh, but this too is what accountability requires in friendship among Christians. We may love our friends, but we may not always like them because none of us is always likable. We grade on one another. We wear one another down. We are ingenious at exasperating one another, especially the, the more you get to know one another. I think the more ingenious we are at exasperating one another. But still, we must love. Ever the realist, Aquinas says that an important element of the life of charity is putting up with people who are burdensome and hard to get on with, which pretty much applies to all of us at some point on our journey together to God. Citing Romans 15.1, where Paul writes, we who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak, Aquinas contends that a life of charity obliges that we not only be patient with the frailties of our friends and be kindly dispo disposed toward them when they struggle, but we should also help them bear their burdens. But we should not tolerate everything. Charity does not mean accepting everything a person does, especially if they are, are developing ways of being, thinking, and acting that are seriously at odds with a life of friendship with God. Ways of being, thinking, and acting through which they increasingly lose their way on their journey to God. This is why Aquinas says fraternal correction, as hard as it can be to practice, is an indispensable element to a life of charity and an especially crucial way that friends are accountable to one another. Aquinas writes, correcting a wrongdoer is a remedy that has to be used when a person falls into sin. 
Now notice he doesn't say it would be good, it would be used, or it would be nice, it would be used, but correcting a wrongdoer has to be used when a person falls into sin. Not only, Thomas says, because the sin hurts the sinner, but also because it tends to hurt other people who are injured or scandalized by it, and because it damages the common good. Importantly, fraternal correction, rather than being something other than benevolence, is a vital expression of it. Because how could we claim to truly want our friend's good if we see him or her settling into any vice and say nothing? So Aquinas says ridding someone of an evil is really the same thing as doing them good and is therefore an act of charity. For it is charity that makes us will our friend's welfare and do our best to bring it about. In a recent article, Darren Davis echoed Aquinas' insight when he spoke of fraternal correction as spiritual rescue and asked if friendship depends on a mutual commitment to seek another's good, how should one friend help to amend another's way when the other's character is in moral peril? And like Aquinas, Davis wonders how we could claim to love our friends if we notice them slipping into behavior that was morally and spiritually damaging and simply watched it happen. He writes, we might put the point this way, if the pursuit of true happiness is as important as we think it is, and if we see someone in dire straits, their moral and spiritual good in jeopardy, how can we as a friend look the other way and remain mute? Aquinas and Davis remind us that friends have an obligation to always change one another for the better. Uh, to me, that's accountability. Uh, a good sign of a good friendship is, does the friendship change us for the better? Sometimes this requires re confronting one another with difficult truths. Of course, if fraternal correction is to be effective and remain an act of charity, it must, Aquinas stresses, be done at the right place at the right time and in the right manner, as well as with a contrite humility that comes from a keen awareness of one's own sinfulness. But if we are fully to grasp how important fraternal correction is for appreciating what accountability requires in Christian friendship, we cannot overlook Aquinas' claim that not to practice it, not to correct a brother or sister in their wrongdoing when we could, is itself a sin. So I hope these reflections on the meaning and shape of accountability in Christian friendship have been helpful. But they stand seriously incomplete because I've said nothing about how in accountability in Christian friendship calls the friends beyond themselves to be accountable for others. For Christians, friendship is not an end in itself. For Christians, friendship exists to serve the plans and purposes of God. As they journey together to God, friends of God are called to share in the creative and redemptive work of God by ministering God's love, mercy, justice, and care in the world to whomever they can, whenever they can, wherever they are, and, and in whatever way they can. But that's a subject for another day. I promised Elver to revolve the last word, and here it is. At the end of spiritual friendship, Elver's classic discourse on how we make our way to God through friendship centered in Christ and accompanied by Christ, Elver describes the ultimate goal and culmination of Christian friendship. In doing so, he illumines not only why accountability in Christian friendship matters, but even more, the unexcelled fulfillment to which it orients our lives. He writes, thus ascending from that holy love with which he embraces a friend to that with which he embraces Christ, he will joyfully partake in abundance of the spiritual fruit of friendship, awaiting the fullness of all things in the life to come. Then with salvation secured, we shall rejoice in the eternal possession of supreme goodness and this friendship, to which here we admit but few, will be outpoured upon all, and by all outpoured upon God, 
and God shall be all in all. As friends of God journey to God, their heartfelt desire is that all people will come to share in that glory. Thank you. or comments or general discussion with Paul and about this topic. Paul, thanks so much for such a good talk. Any? Uh, so, yeah, so yes, yeah. first. Yes, tell us who you are first. I'm David Parrish from the College of the Ozarks. Um, so I really appreciate that, but the way you present it, I mean, friendship is a body. Um, and so my question is, how would you imagine this functioning in our now modern mobile digital society. I mean, are we, when we move, ending friendships, or is there a persistence of that friendship in a digital space that still remains embodied because it was embodied? Or, or how, how do you think this vision of friendship mm -hmm. functions in a, in a mobile digital society? Yeah, actually, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, uh, as I've told somebody earlier, I've been a drunk from this well ever since I started you know, my career in theology, and now I'm doing it in retirement, but, but one of the reasons is I think it's I think this is a crucial moral and spiritual crisis for us today. I mean, I really want to push hard in that. I don't want to weaken at all the claim that we need substantive, rich, enduring, face-to-face -face relationships uh, in which we come to know one another and love one another deeply. Without it, I think our life is tragically impoverished. So it's one of the reasons I, I push back. I mean, I, I think that technology is great. If you have those friendships already formed, they help you stay in touch with people. Uh, most of my good friends, Darren is an example, live quite a ways from Green Bay. Uh, so I'm grateful for the telephone. I'm grateful for email, ways that we can stay in touch. So, but I, I think those are helpful aids to friendship but they can never substitute for it. And, and one of the things, that's why I want to push, I think, we should never enter into friendships lightly and we should never end them lightly. I mean, Albert de Ribot, now he's talking about spiritual friendship, but he describes it basically as, as, as indissoluble as a marriage ought to be. You know, once somebody is your friend, he said, you should, the only reason you should dissolve that friendship is that the relationship becomes spiritually detrimental. You know, if, it, if it harms your, your life in Christ. But even then, he says, don't jump to that conclusion. <laughs> you know, wait and see, and even if you have to end the friendship, speak kindly of the friend, because you, know, you were still friends. So I, you know, I think that's, it's, it's, it's sad to me. Um, you know, I've been blessed in my life that I have known friendships that have, have endured now for more than 50 years. Uh, my life would be so much poorer without him. So that's why I, I think that there's something missing in our world today. I mean, earlier today, um, you know, there's such an emphasis on being busy all the time, being productive, being efficient. And when I would walk around the campus of St. Norbert, it was like students were happy. They were comparing, like, you know, whose schedule was full or like this was a good thing. I thought, wait a minute, you know, that. Friendship demands the kind of, friendship demands the ability to slow down, to be available, and to have what I would call contemplative space in your life. Uh, friendship is an ongoing conversation about things that matter. But if we're always, uh, instead of friends, I call cordial strangers, kind of passing each other on the run, we're never going to have those conversations that touch our souls. Um, so I, th I think that's really an important question. Uh, I think it's a challenge for the church. You know, can we create communities of friendship? We're in our faith <laughs> communities. Uh, we talk about the church being countercultural. I think this is, this is one important way. You know, can we model uh, the kind of culture that needs to be created for good friendships? Because I do think it's a culture. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. In, we live in a culture where we more and more identify ourselves by a sexual identity, so heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, you know, you know the whole mm -hmm. litany. Um, 
And, and we kind of assume that that identity will tell people how to engage with us or how to interact with us. Um, what, what effect do you think that that has had on friendship, that our primary way of identifying ourselves is a sexual identity, and how does that affect friendship and the idea of friendship? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not saying that's unimportant. I think that so much of who we are is a reflection of the story of our lives. And at any point as I tell that story, for a variety of reasons, it might be important for me to voice it, to kind of put it at the forefront. On the other hand, I wouldn't want it to stay at the forefront. To me, one of the, the compelling notions of Aquinas' idea of charity is that we're all bonded together by the fact that we've been loved and befriended by God. Right. Nobody can take that away from us. So I think that's the place to start. Uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's a way of building bridges to start to see people that way. Uh, and that's why, I mean, Aquinas to me is so much more radical than Aristotle was because he believed that there was this community that, of solidarity uh, created by the fact that we're all loved by God. So I, uh, to me, it's trying to call that out. You know, what, who am I as, you, what's the unique image of, of God that I'm called to bring to life in the world? Now that, you know, that includes a lot. You know, my uh, various things that are for my identity. But I, I don't think, I don't think our sexual identity should ever cloud that deeper truth that we're beloved children of God. Uh, I also think it's a great way to tear down walls. Because if I see you know, another person, primarily whether it's sexual identity, religious identity, political identity, uh, the chances are to think, how could we ever connect? You know, uh, so I think we have to connect at that deeper level of, of God's grace. Yeah, I mean, just one observation I've had, especially in the church, is that because we use all relations primarily through a sexual lens, that we become quite suspect of friendships um, that we uh, that we can't. Uh, the the evangelical church seems to me to be very focused on marriage as the proper outlet for sexuality, which is fine. But just kind of if you're not in that relationship, all other relationships become suspect. Like the church doesn't have a clear space for friendship as friendship. Um, because we're so suspicious about what people are doing sexually, I guess. Yeah, well, I think it's, I mean, that's why when I refer to Genesis, I didn't interpret it as a passage about marriage. Yeah. It's just, it, to me, friendship is more fundamental. Yeah. You know, I don't have to be married necessarily to have a good life, but I do need community. Yeah, I, I, need, I, I do need companions. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there, there has to be a way, I think, to elevate friendship as, in some ways, and, and a lot of writers have talked about this, friendship has been marginalized. Because we talk about family, we talk about marriage, we talk about our, our professions. And so friendships kind of get, get, get the tidbits that are left over. Uh, I think it's better to reverse that and, and to base our identity in friendship. Thank you very much. Uh, so the question that I have is, if mutual accountability is essential for friendship, and then friendship with God is paradigmatic friendship, what does mutual accountability look like with God? I mean, specifically, how do we call God to account, or should we? Yeah, that's a great point, and that's why Aquinas, and I should have noted this, doesn't say that we have friendship with God that's exactly like every other friendship. He uses the language as a certain friendship with God as a way of saying there's, there's an analogy. I mean, we can use the friendship language in a way that's intelligible, but we also have to note that there's considerable differences there. Um, but I think there's one way to understand the Psalms is the prayers that call God into account. I mean. Friendships are based on honesty, and uh, at times I might be disappointed with God or frustrated with God. I have to voice that, and the prayer, uh, the Psalms, I think, are, are prayers that enable us enable us to do that. Um, but always remembering that, I mean, that's why I think that the first point, it all begins on a gift, uh, 
And once we live out of that awareness, I think we, we can start to see, well, you know, <laughs> I owe God everything. You know, I can never stop saying thanks. So we may have experiences where we, we, we say, well, I'm not upset with God. Uh, and we can voice that, but it's certainly not going to be, it's not going to be the same. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, one of the most sublime passages in the Nicomachean Ethics to me <clears throat> is when Aristotle says there's no justice among friends. And that might be the, the pagan ideal <laughs> in a way, but I, I see some of that as well whenever he talks about love hiding the two of sins in the New Testament. So I wonder is with the discussion of accountability in relation to friendship, is that vision of no justice among friends sort of an eschatological vision of what kind of friendship would be in the hereafter if we were all perfect human beings? Or is there a place for that even within our notions of accountability? I think it's eschatological in the sense that maybe there's moments in friendship where we fulfill our responsibilities. Our, our friendship is so animated by love that we fulfill our responsibilities without you know, using the language of justice. At the same time, as I, as I mentioned, we are creatively difficult to love. And you know, friendship, I think, is the power of friendship is it calls us to transcend ourselves. Uh, and by focusing my attention you know, on somebody else instead of living in a way that I think I'm the only thing that's interesting. Um, so I, I think that that in that sense, there are times where we can be unfair to friends. You know, we're 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 not just. I mean, so that it's I think justice is 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 a virtue that can be deeply formed in us through friendship uh, because sometimes we can take our friends for granted. You know, we can kind of go along and think. Well, I know they'll always be here, and and therefore, not really be treating them fairly. So, uh, I, I like to use the image. I think there's seasons to friendship, and that's why I, I would always tell my students, you know, when you get to the point where you have forgiveness emerges in your relationship, that's not a sign that the friendship should end. That's a sign that it's become real. Um, and I just think that it, at some point, we, we grade on one another. Uh, we disappoint one another, even the people we love the most, and probably most often the people we love the most. Uh, Tom, thank you. Uh, it's so rich. But I'm curious if, it, if this is even relevant. So the rich way in which you describe friendship, particularly Christian friendship, does that transform the other categories that Aristotle talks about with respect to friendship, like utility and pleasure? I mean, it seems to give you a whole different lens to look through that relation, look to those relations with it. Yeah, I, I think it does. In fact, I, uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about that until I was, I was working on this, but I, one of the, the, the dangers, I think, of Aristotle's category is to, is to think that only virtue friendships matter mm -hmm. Therefore, in those lesser kinds of friendships, it doesn't really matter how we treat people. What I, what I would want to argue is that the very nature of friendship is enmeshed with accountability, no matter what, that, what degree that relationship is. So it doesn't mean that all the friendships of our lives are going to have the same degree of accountability, but they all have some. Um, you know, I was... When I was in high school, I was, you know, God was good to me because my, my layout partner in chemistry and physics was Frank Phillips. And it was just alphabetical order in our, my class. I came after Phillips. Well, it was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me because Frank Phillips was really good at science. I wasn't. So I used to just tell him, Frank, do your thing. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be grateful. Outside of class, were we really close? No. Uh, but there was a kind of friendship there, and now that's, uh, that's more than 50 years ago, and I tell that story to Frank often, because I remember I owe him something. You know? So I, I think that what this opens up is that I don't think we should ever be casual or cavalier towards any of our friendships. 
even the ones that Aristotle might see as lesser ones. Because they're all gifts in, in some way. Uh -huh. um, thank you. I, I really appreciate the value you place on friendship and, and totally agree. Um, I also love how you define people in terms of being loved and being friended by God. And uh, I think Tom Reiner said something similar in receiving the gift of friendship. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I, I work with folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and one of the biggest challenges for them is that people don't see them as friends typically. They have very few friends outside of paid staff family. Um, I'm wondering if you see any kind of account of Christian accountability to befriend the friendless if, if they are beloved and befriended by God. Yes, I absolutely do. Uh, I think that's a vocation of Christians, a vocation of, of the church. Um, I studied with Stanley Harawas, and he always said, you know, we live, we live in God's time not our own, and therefore Christians should be able to slow down and be present to people in ways that maybe our society doesn't encourage. So I, I do think we have a moral obligation to befriend the friendless. Uh, and there's a lot of people, I think, in, in, in our society today that feels that there's nobody who really knows them and loves them for who they are. Uh, that's a terrible condition to be in. So I, I've sometimes used the phrase of adopting a befriending stance towards others. Uh, it doesn't mean I can enter into relationships at the same level with everybody, but it does alert me to be in the world in a different way. And I think that's the key to charity. Charity alerts us to be in the world in a different way so that I don't just see you know, the other person as a nuisance, as a distraction, as somebody getting in my way, but here's an opportunity to befriend them. And if, if, if possible, to let the grace of that relationship blossom. So it's, but I think it's a great example of uh, how God can sometimes take us by surprise. You know, if we open, if we make space in our life for other people, uh, which is always going to be inconvenient <laughs> in some way because now another person has dibs on my time. Uh, that once, if we allow ourselves to be graciously inconvenienced, then the stranger becomes the friend. And I, I think that's, you know, sometimes we forget that we weren't born friends. All of our friends were once strangers to us. Well, what allowed a stranger to become a friend? Each of us was able to be graciously inconvenienced and found out that was a great thing. You know, so I think that's, that's true. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful example that you brought up, but I think, I think that the need for friendship in our society today is so deep. I do think, that's why I said earlier, I think it's a crisis. Um, so can we develop the kinds of habits where we become the people and the church, the community, that tries to respond to that? That last discourse reminded me of Henry Nouwen, who was quite the accomplished academic, but was assigned to work with disabled and was there where he really seemed to perfect his relationship with God in that ministry invocation. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, that's a great, that's a great example, because he, he wrote of how that deepened him, you know, how it, how it changed him. Uh, and so it's, but that requires, again, you know, friendship is impossible without time and availability. And particularly with caring with people who may have special needs, it means we have to slow down. Um, you know, a lot of people are experiencing that day, deal, today dealing with infirm parents. You know, uh, you know my, my mom's in a nursing home in Louisville, my sisters and brothers there, nothing is done quickly anymore. So uh, there's no such thing as a, as a brief visit with my mom, you know, especially if we try to take her out. It's, it's a good half a day, <laughs> at least. Uh, but that's the, you know, I think that's in a good sense, that's the asceticism of love. Ask another one if you don't mind. What are your thoughts then on the notion of political friendship in relationship to what you're trying to work out here? Because it seems to me when you said there's such a need for friendship, seems to me on a wider scale culturally 
There are times which I just feel we hate each other. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, what's dispiriting about that, disheartening about it, it's corrosive. You know, I, mean, I think once the culture gets characterized by unfriendliness, <laughs> and even more than that, you know, a lack of benevolence towards one another, we're in deep trouble. Uh, because what it means is that all we, then we, we, calculate, way, we calculate ways to stay away from one another. Uh, whether it's politically, religiously, whatever, whatever. Well, that's a dead end. And I, I think that, I mean, there's a, a book manuscript I've read recently by uh, Anne-Marie Eliathor that's going to be published by Wiley called A Practical Theology of Friendship. And one of the things that she does in that is one work with uh, Jurgen Boltmann's notion of open friendship. It kind of pushes us, you know, because one of the dangers of this whole friendship model is that it can easily kind of become very comfortable and, and insular. Uh, so I've, I've got my friend, we're journeying together to God, and we kind of wave at everybody, you know, as we go by. Uh, you know, that's why I said at the end, what's, what's missing, what would have to be part two of this, is how do you befriend those that you meet along the way uh, who are different in significant respects? But one of the things that Anne-Marie Eliathor does in that, her book is, is to retrieve the notion of civic friendship. And I think that's key, you know, that it's uh, to extend, instead of seeing friendship as a kind of refuge from the, from the world, to extending it to say, well, what would it mean to have goodwill towards all the members of the society instead of living in suspicion or mistrust. So I think I think that's that's an area that uh, you know, I hope her book is out soon because I think it's in this whole resurgence of, in, of interest on friendship that needs to be really emphasized. It can't just be friendship as a closer relationship where I find my comfort zone and let the rest of the world pass by. The last okay. question. Yeah, um, this is for a friend, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, with unlimited capacity for friendships and in, in this depth, what are the considerations for building a portfolio of, of friends? You know, what, what should we be considering you know, to not overextend ourselves? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the danger of this, and and that's why you know when I was teaching, I would tell my students. Be happy with friendships that don't necessarily reach the optimum. You know, that I think our lives is, is a mixture of all kinds of friendships. Each of them contributes some good to our life as we do to theirs. But also there's, there's times where there's limitations. And that's hard because especially if, I, if I'm looking for more in the friendship than it's not, than not is really possible, that can set it up to, to fail. Um, but I would say, well then, is there a way I can kind of, I can rest peacefully in the good that it offers me and then be grateful for the other relationships of my life? And there may be times, I think, where the kinds of friendships that I'm talking about aren't as accessible. I think there's a lot in our culture that works against it, especially the mobility of our culture. Uh, if you don't stay in one place for a long time, it's hard to cultivate these kinds of friendships. Um, so I think on the, on the one, I think it's to be intentional about trying to create an environment, a culture uh, in our faith communities, in our institutions, where we can befriend one another, but also realizing that there's, there's different realms of friendships in our lives. Maybe the last thing I, I would say, I think, I would have to say in my, in, in my vocation of teaching at St. Norbert College, one of the things that made it a joy is that as colleagues we were friends. It doesn't mean we were, you know, we were together all the time, but, but we would always begin, or not, but more often than not, we would begin our department <coughs> meeting by going around, so I'm not getting moved by this. <laughs> we would go around and ask, just stop and say, how are you doing? You know, is there anything you want to you want to share with the group? Um, sorry, I got something in my throat. But do you have you published anything? Is there anything not going well? Uh, but it was a great way to begin a meeting. 
because it said that you know, first and foremost, no matter what we have to deal with, we're together. And that, that made coming to, that, <laughs> coming to school every day, it made it a joy, because I knew I had friends there. So I, I think to, to find ways to cultivate that, you know, not just in our personal lives, but in our faith lives and our professions, uh, is all ways to experience the, the grace of friendship. Join me in thanking our friend Paul. Thank you. Thank you.